thanks for coming out on this very warm evening and uh, hopefully this won't be too much of a painful uh, experience for you. A bit of biography about myself. I'm Lee Palmer. I'm Head of Planning for Lewis and Eastbourne Councils. Um, I've been in this game for 35, 38 years um, and I have the scars to, to you know, show for that length of service. I'm a member of the Royal Town Planning Institute, uh, part of my profession. So we are a, a, an equivalent profession to you know, chartered architects, chartered surveyors, um, chartered accountants. So we are chartered. So there is a degree of professionality around uh, the conversation that we're going to have this evening. So what Chris has asked me to uh, talk to you around about is broadly uh, what is planning and how do we deal with planning at the council and how do you engage with planning as a community as a society. So I've got some slides that I talk, will talk you through uh, and we've got a, a Q&A session after that if anybody's got any burning questions and Chris has got a cunning tactic to keep you all in the room. I understand I need to draw some numbers out at the end to uh, hopefully um, give you a first, second and third prize. But with no further ado, this presentation has um, a, a number of topic areas within it. Um, a brief conversation around the planning system. Moving on to planning and the local plan. Looking at precisely the third item, how we make decisions, and that's quite a critical uh, path for us. Number four is what is a material consideration. Don't worry about these at the moment, I'll explain as we go through. The fifth topic area is looking at the refusals of planning applications, because again, that's a, a, a critical part of our judgment when we deal with submissions into us. I'm going to end up with some, um, some slides, good, bad and different, uh, and we'll open up to the Q&A at the end. Planning takes place within a legislative framework. And what I mean by that is that um, we know central government passed Acts of Parliament to do certain things. They will be passing Acts of Parliament relating to planning. And in the national press, you will have read recently that the government have produced a white paper looking at planning reform. That happens every now and again, and new planning acts are um, enacted and we have to work within them. So there's national legislation. Beneath that, there are regulations and orders. So the Planning Act is the primary legislation. There's then secondary legislation that makes and interprets the Planning Act and gives us the rules within which we have to make our judgment. Below that still further, our local plan policy and guidance. And then last of all is uh, appeals and case law. So that's the hierarchy that we work within. The important thing to take away from that slide is that we operate in a legislative framework. It's not me sitting in the town hall you know, thinking what should we do. We have to work within our legislative framework. In terms of national legislation, broadly the planning system came into force in 1947. So the 1947 Town and Country Planning Act is the Bible, as we refer to it, and it's been updated periodically since 1947. Within 1947 Act, there was quite a step change in activity. <coughs> Homes for Heroes, there's a big council house boom post-war, covered in the 1947 Act. The importance for this conversation here tonight is the 1947 Act made it a requirement that all local authorities needed a local plan. What's a local plan? Well, a local plan in the broadest sense is work, rest and play. So we need to find areas for people to live, where they work and where they enjoy open space. So you know, when you go home tonight, you drive home, you walk home, however you might you know, get home, then every one of those decisions that you make has had a planner thinking of 
whether it's a junction design, whether it's a bus stop location, whether it's a safe route to school for your kids' grandchildren to go to, go to school, all of those decisions have been made by a planner in the infancy of a project. So that's the importance of the local plan. Just to give a way of example, what does it look like? Well, here's one from 1968, so you know, 50-ish years ago. It's not too dissimilar from the ones that we're looking to prepare now. You will be aware, or well, you may not be aware, but our local plan currently is what the government deem out of date. It's more than five years old, so we're having to refresh that local plan. So what we're doing at the moment is looking to produce another one of these documents that does look at those issues around work, rest and play in, in summary. I, I wouldn't say my forefathers had it easy um, producing this sort of 20 page document, but we now live and operate in a very litigious, litigious environment. So we have to make sure that the evidence behind our new local plan is robust. Because if we don't, it's challengeable by those that choose to challenge it. Uh, I, I had a quick scan through this on the, on, on the train on the way down. Um, their population prediction in 1968 for Eastbourne in 2010. Anybody want to have a guess at what they, Eastbourne's population guessed in 1968? They weren't too far off the mark, my forefathers. 99,000 as a resident population, which is not a bad stat. So we're not too far away from that. So that's, that's, the, that's the good point. And that's the document that we will be consulting on uh, as we go forward with our local plan. So what's the aim of planning? Well, it, its primary purpose is to manage growth in the public interest. The 1947 Act broadly nationalised land. What does that mean? Well, it means that if you want to build something, you need planning permission. Before that Act, you could broadly do what you wanted to do to your own castle and not need planning permission. The 1947 Acts <coughs> took that away, nationalised the land, you now need planning permission. Because that nationalisation was brought in, then we have to engage with the community to make sure that we are making decisions, well-informed decisions in the round, uh, as well-informed as we can. Second point, planning the local plan, it sets out the long-term vision for Eastbourne. You can have a look at this afterwards, but if you think what was here in 1968, well, most of Langley wasn't here for a start, most of Sovereign Harbour wasn't here for a start, but they're all in here as planned... Oh, hang on. Sorry, press the wrong button. They're all in here as, as planned for... Um, within that plan, there's four or five schools equally need to be spatially planned. Where's the best location for a school? That is part of the criteria of developing a local plan. And that's why I like to think of planning as a social science. People often think of planning is, I want to build something, I want to build something, I want to build something. It's more than that. It's a social science. No, it's the work, rest and play. Because we nationalised the land, or working within a legislative framework that nationalises the land, we have to have a framework against which we can decide applications. You know, I, I can't get out of bed in the morning and think, you know, I'm a bit grumpy today, I'm going to refuse some planning applications to make me happy. I have, I have to decide those applications in accordance with policy legislation. So that's the policy framework we're working within. Third from bottom, well clearly the work, rest and play, there's no point having hundreds and hundreds of new houses if there's nowhere for people to work. If they have to travel out of borough to work, that could be perceived to be unsustainable. Getting in the private motor vehicle to drive to you know, wherever is your place of employment is not a real uh, sustainable approach. So the government are now trying to drive home, and we've, 
would have read about this in the, in the national press, 15, 20 minute communities. And what that broadly means is that you should be able to access, access the services that you need within 15, 20, min 20 minutes of your home. That's foot and cycle rather than driving. So what does that mean for Eastbourne? Well, we've designed or looking to design a number of key wards um, around the borough. And if we do define those key wards, then what are those wards going to contain? There's no point having a new housing estate that then has to drive across town to get to the shops, to get to the schools, to get to the other services. So with, within Eastbourne, one of our biggest challenges is the private motor vehicle. And the majority of trips made in Eastbourne are under, un, well definitely under 5k, but primarily under 3k three kilometres. That is the cultural shift that my profession is going to have to try and challenge with when we emerge the next local plan. Because when we do drive around town, we know that the, you know, the big Tesco's junction, the hospital roundabout, is congested. So what we need to make sure <coughs> is that if there's going to be significant housing growth and it's going to be located close to either of those two junctions, we need, we need mitigation. We need to get people out of their private motor vehicle to some other form. That is a challenge. I won't shy away from that. That will be a challenge. Uh, second to last one there. It provides legitimacy, consultation and testing of evidence. So again, coming back to the point about community engagement. When your neighbours are proposing an extension, hopefully, you should receive a letter from the council telling you that's happened and gives you the opportunity to engage whether you choose to or not. And the most important thing, the last one, the planning process does deliver change on the ground. And I come on to later on how you as a community and you as Eastbourne Society can help to impact that level of change. So planning on the local plan. So there's my work, rest and play on, on, on the left. The first bullet point, people often see and think, you know, when you turn on EastEnders, the, 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 often the storyline is around bad stuff. Planning gets a bad rap. Know, in, in, in dramas, on TV, on the news, on the press. It's not about stopping bad stuff happening. That, yes, that is part of our job, but that's not the primary part of our job. The, the main part of our job, as I say, is a social science, where we are proactive, encouraging development that delivers the right stuff in the right place at the right time. So you will hear conversations when we come out for consultation around the next local plan. There will be elements of housing growth in parts of the town. And I'm sure the community will come back around, you know, the schools can't cope, the highway's not good enough, there's not enough doctors, I can't see a dentist. All of those bits of infrastructure have to be thought about and planned at the same time as looking for the housing growth. So it is about positive change, not about saying no although clearly we do say no now and again. So the, the arena that we work within, um, in, in no particular order, but these are the sort of things that have credence in terms of when people put planning applications in. It, it could be, uh, the, the premise could be around climate change, it could be about echo ecology, biodiversity, it could be about heritage, it could be about supporting a town centre, it could be around housing growth. All of them, all of them, all of those are in the mix. So when we decide a planning application, when we have a planning application before us, all of those have to be considered and evaluated. Even if, you know, the third, fourth one down, the heritage assets 
are particularly important to this room, what I'm saying to you is that yes, it is important, but it's important among friends. It's important among other competing issues. So we have to balance all of those issues when we decide um, either a local plan policy, local plan allocation, or a planning application. So the planning decision, so who makes the decision? Some decisions are made nationally. And what I mean by that is, remember on the, one of the first slides we said about national legislation being the primary uh, legislation, and under that is secondary legislation. Part of that secondary legislation is what they call permitted development. So you are allowed to do certain things to your home in general terms without engaging with a planning application because the government in broadest terms have granted you a blanket planning permission. So there has been a change over the last 20 or so years where the permitted development tolerances have grown significantly. And it's a central government's ambition. They see it as freeing up the market and letting people do what they want to do, primarily on the homeowner side, houses, but there are permitted development rights that apply to commercial properties as well. Some, de some decisions are made by others. If we refuse an application at local level, the applicant has a right to challenge that to a national body the planning inspectorate through an appeal decision. So the appeal doesn't come to us, it's administered by an independent third party and um, they make those decisions. Give ourselves a bit of a pat on, the, pat on the back. Most of the decisions are made at a local level with 95% of them delegated. Delegated means that senior officers sign them off as approval or refusal without having to go through to the planning committee and the ones that do end up at planning committee should be the high level strategic decisions. Unfortunately that's not always the case. Mrs Wiggins extension will always wind away onto planning committee but they shouldn't really be there to give them uh, time to consider the place shaping um, schemes and the important thing to take away from planning committee members yes they may be your ward councillor but they have to make decisions in the borough's interest so just because you know, your ward councillor you might be pressurising them to resist it for ward specific issues that list of planning balances may outweigh the ward specific impact so when you are speaking to your ward councillor, they have to act as a borough representative when they make decisions on planning committee. That's quite an important takeaway. So how do Eastbourne, how can Eastbourne society help in decision making? Well, first one first. You are a voice, you have a voice. You have a voice where you can make your views known and you can engage early. Chris mentioned it at the start. So don't shy away from exercising that, that facility. It is important that we hear early any concerns that you may have. Early engagement gives us the opportunity to meaningfully engage with the applicant scheme proposal thereafter. The third one down, in some regard, you're the experts in the room in terms of heritage assets for Eastbourne. What we need as decision makers is for that expert knowledge, local knowledge, local history to feed in so that when we make a decision, we're making the decision as, as informed as we can. The, the, the last one, I think, for, for you is recognition that Eastbourne Society is only one body and that's coming back to that planning balance issue and I'll come on to that a bit in a minute. Uh, single, single interest group 
sounds a bit dismissive. It's not meant to be that, but you're only looking at the heritage asset. You're not necessarily looking at all things, and why should you? You are looking at the heritage asset. Um, moving on, part of the um, case law, remember that first slide, national legislation, national legislation um, secondary legislation, local policies, uh, and then case law. Well, the case law is when a scheme gets tested at appeal. There's a new piece of legislation that gets enacted, means that we have to consider a certain proposal in a certain way. Not, no, there's 350 odd councils up across the country. Uh, we won't all be deciding the scheme the same way. So up in Chesterfield will be slightly different from how Colchester from how Chichester decide a scheme. So that difference is then tested when a scheme is refused, let's say in Chichester, and goes to appeal. That appeal decision then becomes formal case law, which then has a national perspective and gives an interpretation by a High Court judge around the interpretation of that bit of legislation. That's why case law is important. So we tend to call case law material planning considerations. So if you're ever in planning committee in the public gallery or reading the officer's report, you will hear the phrase material considerations and I'll go on to briefly tell you what, what they are, what they are not. So this is a, a direct lift from the 1947 Act. And what that means is because we've got one of these, a local plan, then when we decide schemes, we have to decide schemes in accordance with what that plan says, unless material considerations indicate otherwise. The government are currently consulting on whether the word uh, stronger, unless material considerations strongly indicate otherwise. So they're trying to reinforce that, that issue. So that has sustained from 1947 and is still our main tenant, tenant now. So when we decide applications in accordance with the local plan, unless material considerations indicate otherwise. So again, national policy determined through the courts. Well, the material considerations, the weight that one gives to a material consideration is down to the decision maker. One officer may have one view, another officer may have a different view. Same with you know, your personal perception when you consider your neighbour's extension. You might think it's the best thing since sliced bread. You know, your husband, wife, friend might think it's um, going to cause lots of overlooking. You know, so the, the weight that is given to a material consideration is down to the decision maker. And that's why sometimes the officer's recommendation to planning committee is not supported by planning committee not because they think they not because they think officers have it wrong they have simply apportioned different weights to different material considerations than we have as officers and if they can justify that all well and good a quick list i won't run through them but these, ignore the bottom one, because that's, that's a typo. Um, these are not material considerations. So if your neighbour's proposing an extension and for 40 years you've had a sea view and their extension takes out that sea view, that is not a material consideration, which means we cannot consider that part of your objection. We have... On the town centre commercial side, we have lots of people coming into us to object to proposals simply because it's business competition. There's a hairdresser opening around the corner, it's going to take away my part of my business. Well, unfortunately, through case law, that is not a material consideration. What is a material consideration is the noise, activity, deliveries, those sort of things are material considerations which may make that second application a refusal. But in the first instance, uh, it's not. The, th the third one down, 
land ownership and restricted covenants are not material considerations. So if the Duke of Devonshire has a covenant on a property in Eastbourne that says A, B and C, unfortunately that's not a material consideration. The owner of that covenant has to enforce that covenant. So it doesn't stop us granting planning permission if you wanted to do D, E and F. The owner of that covenant has to enforce it. So you will know as part of your heritage work you know, the Duke of Devonshire and the Chatsworth estate have a lot of property, a lot of land and specific, specifically a lot of covenants across the borough but they are not material considerations. Uh, these are material considerations um, and again not an exhaustive list, there's, there's many many more of this. The important thing effect on listed building and conservation areas is a material consideration but it's only one within others. So when we come to assess a planning application we have to balance the, our assessment against all of those issues. So the government are now moving, developing still further the material consideration uh, position uh, and what they are now moving to is a three-pronged um, assessment around economic, social and environmental and the decision maker has to now decide whether the scheme is sustainable development. Now we may have believed sustainable development is how is a building constructed? Does it use less energy? Is it in the middle of the field in the middle of nowhere? Is it reliant on the private motor vehicle? Yes, it may be yes to all of those, but the important thing is that sustainable development in terms of the what's now called the National Planning Policy Framework, one of those secondary bits of legislation, is the centre of that Venn diagram. So sustainable development in terms of the government eyes is that sweet spot in the middle. Now we might find, for example, that there's harm to um, the environment in its broadest sense by a proposal, but that harm is outweighed by the benefits to the economy, the benefits to the society. So more houses is generally considered to be good in the government's eyes. Supporting the economy, you know, construction jobs, end of use jobs are um, seen positively by central government. Similarly, the societal benefits of having uh, new places to work, uh, new schools, <coughs> are perhaps more beneficial than the adverse impact of the environment in its widest sense. The environment here, of course, is the built environment as well as the green environment. <coughs> so when we come to planning refusals, as you know from an earlier slide, 95% of the time are delegated applications. More importantly, probably 98, almost 99% of our applications we say yes to. So a refusal is quite a rare beast. But if we are going to refuse it, then we have to make sure that the reasons are lawful. And what that broadly means is learning lessons from case law that we're not going to be challenged. It's a defendable position. Based on planning grounds, clearly, evidential material to inform the decision. So what is this getting to in terms of the Eastbourne Society is if, if you're looking to, um, with a heavy heart, look to resist or, or raise an objection to a proposal, then the important thing for us is not the volume of objections that we receive, it's the content of what you say. And what I mean by that is, you know, if there's 300 objections, does that carry any more weight than one objection? No, is the answer to that. It depends what that one objection says. So if that one objection says, I don't like it because of A, B, C, D, E, F, and can clearly articulate the harm caused by the proposal, it's much more likely that we will be able to understand that and look to support or not, as the case may be. 
if you write in and just say, I don't like it, it looks horrible, that doesn't really get us very far. Yes, we've got a, a representation on our file, but the words that you've used haven't really articulated the harm, and that goes down to the evidential basis for the decision. Because if we, if we haven't got any evidential basis, then when we get to the appeal situation, the appeal inspector will overturn. More critical, of course, is there's potential for an award of costs for defending an undefendable position. So, quick run through some, some slides. Um, well, early doors with the, be the, the Beacon Centre. Uh, I can't tell you the amount of hours spent on that corner building. <laughs> some people love it, some people hate it. The design Review Panel didn't like it. My, my personal view is, I think it's, it's neither here nor there. The designs we saw very early, early doors had a much more vibrant peak to that corner. It, it's been su suppressed, um, just to get it through Planning Commission. The, the other thing that really annoys me is there's no door. That seems to be suggesting that here should be the front door to the Beacon Centre. And it's not. You know, and that, that, that does, does great. But the, the benefit, of course, is there's 90 million pounds worth of you know, expenditure in our town centre that is a draw. Um, it, you know, compared to other town centres, touch wood, Eastbourne is still quite vibrant. And that's because we choose to spend money locally. So you know, the investors here have spent an awful lot of cash. Um, and I, I think it, it is working well. The vacancy rate is still too high in my mind, but hopefully they can, they, they, they can get there shortly. Um, down Ashford Road, that, that plank elevation, again, lots and lots of conversation about how do we make that elevation more dynamic. You probably all in your car just drive by without even looking at it. But no, if you do take a moment to have a look, there was conversations around now, do we have illumination in certain locations? Do we need to articulate it you know, in and out more? Is it high enough? Is it bland enough? But you know, the purpose of this slide is, you know, I don't think the corner is dynamic enough. It's a bit su suppressed. And then, of course, we lose all the beauty by street furniture, you know, which we have to live with, with high, highway safety. And we lost the argument about getting the bus out. You know, making it truly pedestrianised would have been, would have been ideal. But again, it is what it is. And if if you ever look at a tourist survey, in terms of the tourist destinations, unfortunately, it's not the pier, it's not even the seafront, it's the shopping centre, scoring very very highly. Uh, and that, I think that's because up and down the country, people's shopping centres are very very depressed suppressed with lots of vacancy rates, not so much here. So a big pass on the back to the, to the beacon. Uh, this one, this is, I don't know whether you know this, this, this is Moira House School, um, proposal for redevelopment into um, high-end residential. So first building, the middle building and, and, and the one on the far left, are the existing school buildings retained, um, converted into flats, all other existing buildings demolished, replaced by large dwelling houses. So uh, they are very, very large. Now, those that have followed this case will probably be aware it went through planning committee with the least amount of grief I can probably remember from an application of this size. Now, that is probably testament to the fact that they engaged early with Meads Community Association and others to try and solicit their views. From a planning professional point of view, this scheme is challenging for, for us as professionals. One, there's a lot of green space. Great, you may say. What we need to do, because land is so precious in Eastbourne, we have so little development land, 
than what any planning professional would want to do is to maximise the development potential. Because if they don't use brownfield land that this is, then unfortunately you can have to end up either going into Eastbourne Park or building on the Downs. Neither of those are palatable. So the consequence of a low density scheme here is that the dwellings have to be provided elsewhere. Similarly, well not similarly, but behind this building here, you can see a bit of ornamental garden behind this one. You, you will see, um, oh there's a pointer. <laughs> behind, that's a, that is a green roof on top of a multi-level car park. So their scheme is heavily reliant on the private motor vehicle. Now, the argument goes that, you know, we mentioned before about trying to get people out of the private motor vehicle and trying to get them to use sustainable modes of transport. If, if you build a multi-storey car park, well, it's going to be used. So that's, you know, again, why it grates, grates with us. The third reason that it grates with us is there's zero affordable housing. It's all private housing and they've justified that on the cost of the conversion of these three buildings, the cost of the extent of these new homes and the cost of that multi-level car park is expensive. That means the only way they can walk away with a profit, they have to hit our affordable housing policy. Which means that in here, not this one, it's 1968, but the current version, is that we have policy in this location of the town should be providing 40% affordable. You know, for when your children, grandchildren want to buy a home, they're then going to be out of afford one here, that's for sure. So who is there who is this appealing to? Is it appealing to aspirational Eastbourne Eastbournians? Eastbournians? <laughs> or are they out of towners coming down from London? You know, that's that's the thinking that we're going to have to go through. The, the short point is, it's got planning permission. Planning, planning committee loved it. So uh, that's the difference between planning committee and myself as a planning professional. I have to put a case forward. And that went through relatively unscathed. Um, the, the smallest amount of debate I've ever seen at, at planning committee. Now then, this is the Port Hotel. Uh, along the seafront. Again, you probably won't believe the amount of correspondence we've had uh, around this building. Now, what you may also not know, going back to that permitted development right that the government have enacted and rolled out nationally, you don't need planning permission to paint your building. So that's why he was allowed to do that. Um, because we had no control. He can paint it that colour, any colour he, he chooses. What I will say though is that the operator of this facility has in some eyes upped the tourist game. I don't know whether you've been around, I don't know if you had friends and family that stayed there, but I've heard very good reports around the quality of the products that's provided here. So in terms of um, the holiday accommodation, it, it's, it's up there in terms of the top percentile of, of, of hotel accommodation in, in the town. But in terms of heritage asset, you know, a lot of people didn't like the shades of grey that we're now uh, seem to be inundated with. <coughs> um, I just put this one up just to say that. I don't know whether you know this, this is the corner of Langley Road and Seaside. Single story, parade of shops, it's been falling to disrepair for, for, for many, many years. The council stepped in and, and bought these last uh, three. And just because it became too much of a, a blight and eyesore from that key location. Now, this is what's gone back. And hand on heart, it's not the best building. I'm not going to say to you that that's going to win any design awards. But it is... Uh, 11 affordable units, giving people uh, council housing uh, affordable units, and it does transform that, that derelict site. So sometimes, you know, we have to look at the bigger picture. So this is an illustration as to what the 
the, the bigger picture can sometimes be. And again here, zero car parking, walk, walkable to the town centre. So this, this, this raised quite a few hackles with, 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 with yourselves and you know, quite a broad um, concern. Going back to the conversation about town centres, the, the department store has had its day, unfortunately, so we're never going to get a department store back in. So we're having to look at how we're going to either re-enliven the town centre in this part of town uh, and, or, and or create new places for people to live. People living in town centres increase footfall, it increase um, spend locally. So you know, whether, whether you, you like that or not, that was the proposal at that stage to demolish the existing building and replace with that. And as Chris uh, alluded to at the start, that is the current manifestation. So it's what's called a facade retention. So this bit through here is being retained. They're retaining commercial space on the ground floor. And then all of this, you know, the mansard roof and the two wings either side, are residential. Now, again, this has a cost. It's very expensive for side retention. So the, the cost of that means that, we got, although you can't see it on this slide, the upper floors have been extended. So whilst this was one big flat, big flat roof, deeper into the plan form here, they step up another two or three storeys to make it pay. And again, we are not getting any affordable housing. We're not getting any community infrastructure levy. We're not getting any section 106, and this county want a new bus stop outside. So we're not getting anything to mitigate the harm of that development. What we're getting is the facade retention. And what we have to do as part of the planning balance is, is that retention the overriding material consideration such that all other policies have less weight and less material issue for us? Do we like that? Is that, is that better, one on the left? Lots of nods, lots of nods. So the Claremont, opposite, opposite the pier, obviously burnt down. It's, it's time flies, but it's probably is it two years since it since the fires. So, something at least. So what are we, what are we going to do? Well, the issue is that this building is probably one of the oldest in the town. This building is seen on many, many old images as to an identifier of Eastbourne. When you're standing on the pier, it is a key view. And hence, given all that history, given all that pedigree, it's what's called Grade 2 star listed building. So Grade 1 is the top level. We only have two in Eastbourne. Um, guild, um, the church at the, uh, at the Lamb, next door to the Lamb pub, and the manor house in, on the estate. There are two grade one listed buildings. Very limited grade two star. This one and the Congress Theatre spring to mind. Others, not, the vast majority, are grade two. So in the eyes of the government, in terms of listing, this entire facade is materially important. As you know, it was a hotel. Why have we got so many hotels on Eastbourne Seafront, you wonder? My answer to that is because of this. We have a policy with our local plan that prohibits the change of use of hotels into flats because of the importance that the tourist economy plays to the wider economy. So you go to the places like Worthing, Shoreham, Hastings, it's hard to get a seafront hotel. They were all there once upon a time, they've all gone to flats. The reason that we haven't lost our seafront hotels is because of planning. 
So we have a policy that says you can't change two flats here. The question for you, and it's a rhetorical question, can we insist on that policy? Can we still apply that policy if the hotel doesn't exist? If, if it's a hole in the ground now, are we looking at a different, um, a different set of circumstances? Well, in the eyes of the government, the planning policy is the planning policy. So we've been negotiating for the last two years to try and get the current hotelier to invest in rebuilding the hotel without much success, I must say, because it is very expensive. So again, and again, don't take these images away with you necessarily, but what they are speaking of at the moment is a facsimile building to the one that was lost on the frontage and on the corner, a contemporary wing on the back with a new lump on top. That new lump on top is potentially a public restaurant. So you can begin to think around the planning balance. Is, is this use important? Well, it clearly is if it sustains and gets off the ground. But that, to get that, we might have to sacrifice the hotel use and consider residential. Now, you as a community, you as a society may say, well, that's a price worth paying if we can get that building back. Historic England are probably of your mindset. It's important to get the building back for its townscape, its impact on the seafront. It'd be better to have a building than no building. And we have to wrestle, therefore, with how do we square the issue around our planning policy that says you can't lose hotel accommodation. This set of circumstances has to be so unique that it can't be replicated. I'm, I, don't, I don't mean the fire. <laughs> what, I mean, what I mean is other hoteliers, because residential is so profitable compared to running a hotel business, I can guarantee that every hotelier would sell their hotel tomorrow to residential if they could. So we need to be certain that if we do jump to resi on here, that it is a set of unique circumstances that cannot be replicated. So that, that's me done, and thank you for um, staying with me for the last half hour or so. Any right. questions? Um, is, is that uh, how that one uh, you know, can be refused? It, yes, is a simple answer. It, Listed building is, is, is other legislation um, and you need listed bail and consent in those extreme cases. Brunswick Terrace, probably grade one listed building. So up there with Buckingham Palace, you know, the, they don't get any better than that. And because of that, they need controls over the, the, the colour of you know, the, the Brunswick cream, as you mentioned. Here in Eastbourne, yes, there would have been shades of cream over the years um, and nobody really challenged it somebody's come in, asked the question, and unfortunately the legislation is not on our side, and that particular building, we couldn't stop them painting it the colour they chose. Change has already been instigated before uh, the application is actually made. Yeah. Um, very good question. The government in the white paper at the moment are looking to double the planning fee for a retrospective application. Um, not, not as a penalty, but to recognise the fact that it's probably had um, enforcement team round to look at it. It's had to have a planning application, so they, they can double the fees. Notwithstanding that, um, professionally, we have to assess the application as if it hadn't have happened. So there's no penalty on the applicant. There's no frowning and you know, smack around the chops. You've been a naughty, naughty boy. We have to assess it as if it hasn't happened. And if the impacts of it are okay albeit retrospective, then we have to grant planning permission. Thank you very much. Centre, rather than the one we have at the moment for an information centre. That, thanks, for, thanks for that um, question. Yeah, the criticism is, you know, in some regard, is w w well founded. Remember, of course, that competition is not a material consideration, so we've got no control over who takes uh, the shop, whether it's a flower seller or... You know, 
Cornish pasty shop or whatever. We've got no control over that. I do take your point around the um, Choice Information Centre being relocated. That's a decision above my pay grade. Uh, I wasn't party uh, to that. The, the, the benefit of being you know, around the corner here, I guess, is it does bring footfall into the Welcome Building. So that's, that's the benefit. The disbenefit, of course, is the one you've just articulated. Thank you. The former police station at the top of Grove Road. The second one first. Um, planning permission has been given to convert it into residential. The same owner as the owner of the BT building in Moy Avenue. The, that developer has what's called um, stockpiled um, those developments. Uh, we are in relatively regular contact with them to see whether they want to, to commence development. And this is where the legislation is quite toothless. We can't in compel them to implement their scheme if they choose not to. So it's still in private ownership, the same as the applicant at the application stage. Um, and it was going to be our first, I know I showed you a car free scheme there, but it was going to be a car free development. Um, and unfortunately, it is another big empty building in the heart of our town centre, which is regrettable. In terms of uh, affordable housing, um, they, the, the definition is, um, well, the, the, the government keep blending the, the, the definition. We have now got first homes, which essentially is a shared ownership product that the government are rolling out. Um, so that means that you rent part of your property and you buy a part of your property. So the, the shared ownership model is still there. And uh, we still have an aspiration for truly affordable in our mind is affordable rent, which is somewhere between 60 and 80% below private market rent. So that's what we would uh, endeavour to do. The issue for small places like Eastbourne is that the registered providers, the affordable housing providers, d don't want to come to town for half a dozen units. It's not worth their business model to travel down from Birmingham to maintain uh, a property. So we are always up against trying to find registered providers to take them on. That's why we are now building our own, going back to building our own council houses. And the slide I showed around Langley uh, Corner their traditional council houses. So we're having to step in where the market doesn't deliver. Moira House, zero affordable. TJ Hughes, zero affordable. Esperance Hospital, zero affordable. Three very big schemes. We're not getting any affordable housing out of it. And that doesn't foster balanced communities in my view. The same will probably be true when they come to redevelop what is now the University of Brighton site. Very, very much so, and those sites, uh, if, the bright, if the university does choose to vacate, um, then those sites will have to form part of our new local plan, so that we can make sure that the, the, the best use of those sites uh, are planned for. Because if they're not plan, planned for, then we can't make sure that the infrastructure that's needed to support them comes alongside. The overall yeah. planning landscape and could you tell us anything about it if it does? Yeah, thanks. Even back as far as 1968, Eastbourne Park and Pevensey Levels was identified as a key habitat, a key protected area. So we will be looking to control, enshrine as much as we can, both of those important assets for two reasons, well, a number of reasons. One is that they are functional floodplain, so it, it stops the rest of the town getting flooded from river flooding. Second, it creates important habitat for ecology, wildlife. And, and thirdly, you know, they are open spaces to which, to some degree, we can get in and enjoy. Uh, having said that, you know, one of the problems with Eastbourne Park is, you know, parts of it are unaccessible to the general public. So part of the local plan thinking will be how can we increase what we call permeability into and through parts of Eastbourne Park, because it'd be great to have a cycle path from the town centre to the hospital. 
without having to go up, you know, that very busy, busy road, for example. Thank you. It's, it's a very good question. The, the, the way the legislation works at the moment is we are, as you would expect, uh, borough and district specific. So we, whilst we have what's called a functioning geography, so people from Eastbourne work in Will, you know, Willingdon and into Wilden and vice versa. So it's a functional em employment geography which is larger than the borough boundary. In terms of planning, the borough boundary is quite hard. So what we are finding is that we consistently object to developments on our boundary, whether it's Willingdon, whether it's Pevensey, where it might be, and Wildon turn around and say, well, we hear what you say, but we need the houses. It's going to go there because it can't go up the north of their borough for Ashdown Forest impacts. So we recognise that, but you're right. One of the challenges for us is that literally everything comes downhill. You know, water travels downhill, when you flush the toilet it comes downhill, all the transport will be into the town centre to service the new, new, new shops, that will be traffic that will be coming our way. Um, so yes, all the impacts, education, public open space, is all impacted upon Eastbourne and unfortunately if Wildon don't want to run with that as a concern, there's very, very little we can do. Time and how do you go about re, re, um, re, re recruiting? Yeah, the, the, the question is if you didn't hear it, is planning permissions are time limited. So when we grant permission, the development has to start within three years. If the development doesn't start in three years, that permission is essentially in the bin, and the applicant would have to reapply to. Uh, ask the question again and there's no guarantee necessarily because it was approved in 1977 we're going to say yes in you know, 2023 22 so they would have to reapply uh, you're right we have a lot of unimplemented housing schemes the police station Moy Avenue you know, two cases in point and we probably got over a thousand um, residential units that haven't been built and that is a challenge. Thank you. I mean, is it just fairy tales? <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't want to comment on any, 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 any political point, but I think, I think, I, I, I think you might be right. The, the, the issue is um, we had an announcement, as we all know, that we were going to get a new hospital. Uh, the conversations that I've been having with, with the... Uh, NHS Trust for our particular hospital is that the, they haven't received the money sufficient to build a new hospital. So what they're looking to do at the moment is to upgrade what we've got. So at the moment, you, if you follow the plan applications, you will see solar panels, you will see uh, some extensions to the hospital. What you won't see, unless things radically change, is a new hospital. The draft scheme that we did see when following Boris's first announcement of, of the you know, tens of million pounds awarded, um, it was going to be where the car park currently is. Yeah. So it would bring it closer to, I forgot the name of that road, but where, Drive. Yeah, be, be on the King, quite hard on the King's Drive boundary and then the car parking would be uh, the other side. Uh, part of our key housing site, the back side of the hospital, there's a lot of accommodation there that is not now needed for modern clinical care. So there's, there's a laundry, there's, there's stuff like that that is all off-site now. There's, so there's a potential for us to win some housing on those former, now likely to soon to be redundant, um, clinical space. A lot of people have been made population is, is higher here, yeah. so why don't we have it? And, and, and that's part down to the clinical commissioning group yeah. to you know, decide where they want to spend their money because the trust, as you quite rightly say, is the Conquest, Bexhill and Eastbourne is one trust. Right. 
So they have to design their facilities across that one trust. Um, and you know, at one point we were looking to lose maternity cover at the DGH to go to the conquest. You know, that, so that's you know, it is a very important issue. I appreciate it's a very important issue, but planning can't influence it more than we are doing at the moment, and that is bring it into the forefront of conversations with the trust managers. Um, if the trust managers haven't had the money from central government, because it may have been a bit of a hollow pledge, then then you know, we can only do what we can do. We're going to be raised to be housing. You know, it may, may be completely wrong. There's, there's a half truth there, uh, <laughs> and 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 again, like the clinical space in the hospital is now redundant. The academic space in certain buildings at the college is now not fit for purpose. So what the college are looking to do is contract down to their new hub, which is their new front building next, next to the running track, uh, which then will relieve, release potential for the existing buildings deeper into their uh, estate to be put to a new use, which could be residential. In answer to your concern about the playing fields, they're QE2 trust, so they cannot be built on. Each year, so that perhaps they may be lobbied. Thank you. Th thanks for that question. Um, in my presentation, I mentioned about the, the levelling up white paper that was looking at planning reform. And the six, well, several months since that was launched, every person in my position, every member of uh, local council up and down the land was in a tailspin to try and work out what does that mean? Do we have to change our departments? Do we have to restructure? Then Boris goes and does what he does and loses his position. So now it's all up in the air. So it's fish and chip paper. So what I'm saying to you in answer to that, a very good question. Councillor Tut did deliver on this promise and we have reprofiled Conservation Advisory Group. It is now a, well not now, it is a public forum. The membership is, has been extended to include representatives from um, this establishment, your society. So you can come along and witness. Uh, you can uh, engage with your uh, representative to speak on your behalf on particular matters. And the remit of planning of Conservation Advisory Group has been extended to not only be planning applications, but to be schemes, things that are significant to heritage assets that might not yet be a planning application. For example, works at the Baron Stand, things like that may not yet be a planning application, but may come to Conservation Group in terms of its new remit to be discussed. So I apologise for the leader not coming back to you directly, but he was a man of his word, he did act on your request. And, and we have got now the Eastbourne Society uh, membership back into a public forum. Thank you. What, what is reasonable to object and what is not reasonable? It, horses for courses, that's the trouble with planning. It's not, black, it's not black and white. Judgment is judgment and your judgment's going to be different from my judgment on a particular issue. So I come back to the point around it's very legitimate for you to object to a planning application, but you need to articulate why you don't like it. If you don't articulate it, then all it is is numerically another objection. So I can't say without a specific scheme what you need to be focusing on, but it does come down, as I say, to the words that you use. Hotel. How far into the negotiations have you got to it? Without breaching any confidence, it's to the sketched form. So we've received this drawing, we've put it before Historic England, um, and they have been generally neutral to positive around the facsimile front facade. Um, they were non-committal about the, the rear and the top wing. But it's not a planning application, it's far from being a planning application yet. So, realistically, it's some years away? Potentially. Yeah. Potentially. Okay. Thank you. Second one is, 
Um, can you update us on what's happening to the land where the law courts were? Yes, that is in uh, EBC ownership. We bought it from the Ministry of Justice to um, build, again, some council housing. The, the scheme that came in from our colleagues in the design team, the housing team, uh, was, in our professional view, a bit too much. Uh, we bounced that, that concern back to them and that scheme got withdrawn. Uh, and now the design team are, are scoping what they do with it next. Whether to look to recast their own proposals or look to bring in a development partner to do it alongside. Thank you. So the ruling is about granting HMOs. Yeah. Very top topical issue. Going back to that permitted development point I mentioned uh, in a previous slide, the government have uh, outlined, uh, again through case law, that you don't require planning permission to convert your house into a house of multiple occupation if there are six or less people living in it. So that's part of the challenge, is it's not requiring planning permission for the vast majority of the conversions that we see. If it's six or more residents, then planning permission is required, and then we can begin to bring into play car parking, refuse and recycling, those sort of issues. What we need to be careful of, of course, is don't conflate uh, the, the bad landlord. Not everyone's a bad landlord. We've got some very good landlords in the town and they do provide a type of accommodation that some sectors of our community need because they can't afford to go anywhere else. We do have aspirational um, business people who are living in HMOs. So, you know, I, I think it's dangerous to say that every HMO is a bad thing. It's not, it just, it just needs to be managed. But you're quite right, there's places of, in Devonshire Ward where a lot of those small Victorian houses, because they're quite small, can all and have all been converted into houses of multiple occupation without any control from the planning department. And that is unfortunate. How many times can an application be refused before the applicant cannot ever apply again? The, the simple answer is that there is no limit, apart from if they have had a refusal and challenged at appeal, then there's a time em embargo. So you can't reapply following a dismissed appeal and I think it's within two years. But if, he, if you don't appeal, then you can keep chipping away. And some developers do, do play that game. They wear on uh, community fatigue, fatigue, officer fatigue, and, and keep, keep chipping away. And we know developers, they come in big. We know they don't really want big. They want something down here. So they're seen as the good guys because they change big to something down here. But that's what they really wanted anyway. Can you help us with any further developments about what is going to happen to the Debenhams building, please? Uh, the short answer is that we've spoken to the land agent. Debenhams for Eastbourne, different from many other Debenhams around the country, is in single private ownership. And that person has no real desire at this moment in time to look to redevelop which is unfortunate. So what we're, getting, what we're doing at the moment is similar to the conversation we're having with the DGH colleagues, is trying to encourage a conversation about um, getting them to think about redevelopment, because it will be a redevelopment. Um, a department store is not going to come back in, so it will be a redevelopment. The developer, of course, has to make sure that it's going to pay, and they're not going to start a scheme that they can't afford to finish. So we are having conversations with them and in broad terms it's going to be something similar to TJ's ground floor commercial with multi-level residential. How high that multi-level residential is a conversation piece at the moment. Yes, it seems to be an awful long time. Is that government legislation or local legislation? It's not ours, it, 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 it's, it's enshrined in, in, in national legislation. No. You, can, you, can ex, you can extend it, you can, can make it shorter than three years, 
three years seems to be the uh, a, a balance. If you're looking to build a big scheme out, by the time you've done all of your surveys, by the time you've commissioned all of your evidence base, you know, decontaminated the site, it, it takes that sort of time before you can actually make, make a start. The, the government are worried about the number of schemes we said yes to that haven't been implemented. And as I say, we've got around a thousand units at the moment that could be implemented but are, haven't been. Granted, and then nobody would do anything with it. Is, there any, is, is that scheme going ahead? No, right. it, it, it is, <laughs> is the answer. Um, for those that don't know, the council stepped in and bought the land because uh, affordable housing provider wasn't building it out. So we stepped in and bought it with the ambition of building council houses, uh, with the support of central government giving us some grant aid. Uh, that grant aid has now dried up. So we are looking to hold off on implementing that scheme because of the grant funding that we were to receive made it viable. At the moment, the scheme's not viable. Now, in terms of the heritage asset that is the Bethwell pumping station, uh, we are looking to uh, make it safe, secure the proof whilst we decide what, what's going to happen. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, can I have a big round of applause for you?